So yeah, so Alex asked me to you know come speak, and I was trying to think, okay, what am I going to speak about? Because I'm brand new at Meta, and you know still trying to get my feet wet. So what I thought was I'll just talk about um, you know what my role is at Meta, kind of how we're approaching problems, and uh, just the space in general, and how uh, I'd like for the industry to collaborate. I don't know all the range of people over here in terms of like what you're working on. Uh, but definitely, hopefully, it, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to go a little fast through this, but I'm trying to uh, talk about this at a higher level rather than trying to answer deep questions, which I'll expect from the papers over here. Um, but, uh, you know, this is kind of just posing the challenge and posing what we've been working on. Uh, part of this is uh, I, I tried to do this presentation. If you've seen me speak before on the display uh, industry forums, I try to build on that, so I had to build this deck from scratch because I've switched companies now, and uh, let, me, let me get to it. So basically, what I'm going to be talking about is the perceptual image considerations uh, for AR, VR, and why it's important for us to start thinking about things differently. Like, what is, what is different about this, right? Why, why, do we, why do we care? Why don't we just use the same specs that we've been given uh, for uh, existing displays? So the trend is, you know, we started off with a big, giant screen in a theater, right? 20 feet screen. You're 30 feet away from the screen. You know, it's, it's, it was a good experience, black and white, well, like 20 frames per second maybe. Um, and then that TV started, I mean, that screen started getting closer to you. You got the 65 inch, now you have 80 inches. There's even a 108 inch screen, right? Uh, and then that started to get closer to you. And that's because we were able to create that fidelity on smaller pitch and we were able to bring that experience closer and closer to you. And we're, we brought that onto a phone, which was, was, which was in your pocket, and then on a watch with a 1.5-inch screen. I got a new watch, finally. It's like <laughs> uh, and then, of course, you know, VR, and, uh, VR you, know, you have these one point, that watch screen on your face, basically, right? And uh, finally, we're, we're going to get to, oh, well, there's also AR, which is the pass-through version. So you have an imager, and you can see through it. Uh, and basically, we're in, in this kind of new era where we're going from this one screen to multiple screens, right? And, uh, of course, ultimately, people are talking about contact lenses, but, yeah, that's probably a little further out in the future. Uh, but what are the challenges here, right? So um, what are the display differences? You know, when we're looking at the real world, we're looking at an object. You get two different images to each eye. We're getting a full light field uh, that comes to your eye, and so you can focus differently. Uh, and then what we did was we created these the screen plane where we're capturing a projection of the real world onto a plane, and both eyes see the same picture, right? So it's not um, it's not quite a, a light field. It's not it's a, it's a representation of the world, right? So how's how are things changing? Basically now we're going to go from one screen that was far away that you were looking at with both eyes to two screens right next to your eye, right? And we're trying to recreate that light field. Well, maybe we're intercepting it on a plane, right? Ideally, we would create a full light field so that we can uh, we can get you know full uh, focus and everything like that. But for now, we've got these two screens, right? And you know, what are we going to do with the two screens? And why is it different? And what are the challenges there, right? So the way I look at it is if, when we were talking about the one screen, we were talking about you know, four axes of, of image quality, right? So you're looking at dynamic range, color, frame rate, and resolution. And frame rate and resolution were kind of the, uh, the things that everybody was going after and, uh, and the past, I don't know, since 2008. Uh, a lot of my work with Dolby was around dynamic range and color, right? So, uh, but when you look at dynamic and range and color, most of the time we're talking about preference, right? So when you look at, when we're talking about preference, we're like looking at what do people want from an image rather than what do people absolute need. Now it's, it depends on the application, right? So, so what we did uh, in the past in the standards and Dolby and all the uh, companies that were looking at HDR, we were specifically looking at how do, how do people respond to an image and what would they prefer? So they would look at these pictures and and they would be really happy and surprised and, and wowed by the amazing 4,000 nit pulsar that had also water cooling and cool lights on the back of it, the steampunk monitor. 
That's basically what we refer to it as. Um, but what was really cool is that image that came off of the front of it uh, had a 0 0.005 nit uh, capability in the blacks, right? And it was all, uh, capable of 4,000 nits in the brights. And then you can kind of see the, uh, the, the, the percentile of people that were pleased with, what different, uh, with the different black levels and, and with the different uh, peak brightness levels, right? So, uh, you know, based off of this, we were able to look at what people want. So, if, you know, if we have 0 0.1 nits, you're only getting about 50 percentile of people. So do we consider that HDR? Well, you could, right, because of the, all of the tone mapping tricks. But you kind of want 0 .00, uh, 0 0.01 and 0 0.005 as kind of your black level to really give you that impactful image, right? And on on the peak brightness, we were talking about you know 400 nits kind of being where where all the TVs were at when we started introducing HDR, but that only pleased five percentile of the people, right? So in order to get to 90 percentile, you've got to be in the 10,000 nit range, right? So it's so if you even at 4,000 nits, you're only getting 60 percentile of people uh, pl uh, getting that wow experience, right? So, so as you can see, it's very very clear that this is really good in guiding us on where we should have, uh, should be going in terms of uh, image quality. So it's you, we put pip, uh, this SDR picture in front of people; they liked it but they were wowed by this, right? So obviously it was an area of improvement and a direction for us to go. So when we look at these axes of, of, of improvement and image quality, you can see that you know, it's a preference in terms of getting to frame rate. Of course, you know, it's like at 15 frames per second, it kind of becomes you know, an unpleasant experience, but at least it's not gonna make you sick. It's just gonna be like, that's not something that I'd watch. Um, but at 60 frames per second, you know, that's quite, it's quite a pleasing picture. And then at 120 and 250, you know, what, it depends on the t type of content. If you're watching sports, you kind of want that higher frame rate, right? Uh, in terms of color gamut, this was the same. We started with black and white. It wasn't unwatchable, right? It was still a, a good experience. It played its purpose uh, at the time. But as we started to get Rec. 709, and then we got P3, and then we got Rec. 2020, it really changed the way we saw pictures. We could represent the real world closer to the way we wanted to represent, right? So, so the, the part of our goal at Meta is to pass this visual Turing test at some point. Now, what is this visual Turing test? That if you were to hold up a display and you're wearing a headset, you won't be able to tell the difference between reality and the display. So you'll be able to take the display, the display off and look at the world, and you look at it in the display, and they both look the same. Right? So that's, that's where we would like to be. Right? Um, and that's, that's basically the North Star. How are we going to get from where we're at to there? Yeah, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge, but we definitely need to start improving on these axes to get there. Right? So... Um, so when we get to this two display thing, well, it gets to start being a little trickier because you start getting into uh, territory that could like be kind of uh, uh, dangerous, right? So you know, what, what are the things we've got to get right, and what are the things we've got to do really well? Uh, it's, this is what I call the nine axes of improvement and of image quality, and in a second I'll tell you why it includes other things, but basically, we've got the same dynamic range, color gamut, uh, frame rate, and resolution, which is what everybody speaks of today and everybody understands. So, you know, what are these other things? Well, stereo, well, we had 3D for a while, but it went away because people didn't like it, right? So, you know, what, why didn't people like it? We've got to look at what those failings are and what can we fold back, because this is going to be the same story over here. We've got to do stereo, but we've got to do it right. You know, we have to take into account personal IPD because every single one of us look at the world differently based on our IPD. So if you're not presenting the exactly the right picture to each eye, it becomes uncomfortable after a while depending on where that object is in, the, in your, uh, your, your field of view and, and where, you're, where it sits in terms of depth, right? So, uh, you know, how good that stereo is is pretty important, right? I mean, if you get it wrong, there's some tolerance. Where, where's that tolerance? A uh, frame rate becomes starts to become more important um, because you can start getting uh, you know disturbed by lower frame rates and where's that threshold? Of course, latency is an important thing because if this thing is tethered to your head, you know when you turn, 
it depends on what the application is. Is it going to be a head-locked experience, or is it going to be world-locked? And if, if the world and the horizon doesn't move correctly with you, you're going to have some you know, vestibular ocular uh, discomfort there in terms of like how, what, how your brain's expecting things to be and what's going on in your ears. Right? Uh, degrees of freedom. You can have three degrees, six degrees, right? So it, it, those, those are the things that are going to get introduced when you, you're, you're sticking these two imagers on your face. And then, of course, accommodation and virgins, which I think a lot of people have heard about now, and so I don't, don't have to go too deep into it, but basically the idea is uh, where are you focusing at and where are your eyes verging at? When your eyes cross, that point where your eyes cross is your uh, ciliary muscle Focusing, uh, squeezing down on the lens to make it focus on the retina at that distance, right? So when you have a display basically in front of your eyes, you're focusing on that fixed plane, right? With the optics, it's at some fixed distance. And it doesn't change with what object you're looking at. So do we have to account for that? Do we have to fix that? And, you know, whether those, uh, there's a lot of studies been going on around it, but basically it, it really depends that on that feature on, on distance from you. Like how far away are you, uh, is this object that you're looking at, and how, how much do you have to interact with it, right? So, um, yeah, and then, of course, field of view. You know, smaller fields of views are easier to deal with. The larger fields of view can make you sick. So basically, you know, these are, these are kind of the nine that I think we have to be talking about, and how do we get to the outer edges of this and pass the visual Turing test on all of these, right? So, uh, you know, so what can go wrong if we get these wrong? On the other side, so we're trying to get to a visual Turing test on one side, but on the other side, this could be the problem, right? And this is exactly what we want to stay away from. So I guess my challenge to everybody over here is not so much how do we get from here to the visual Turing test and passing the visual Turing test, because each of us as a company want to hold, hold that as our secret you know, key to success to get, to get there. But in terms of that, I think we all have to agree and be on the same page in order to make sure we don't cause this in our, uh, in our customer base because that will only do one thing, turn away people from all products related to AR, VR, right? So, so we got to work together on this basically, right? So like I said, on the other four axes, there's like 50 plus years of standards, but on these, and when it comes to image comfort, we haven't really talked about like what standards, there's that's, that's few, to, if any, right? And so we really need to create some standards groups and we need to standardize on the same language and the same metrics and create what, what, you know, what I think is a minimum viable product. So for example, um, you know, in terms of comfort, frame rate, you know, if, if you, it, you, we were talking about preference and I put like the little thumbs up sign for the preference, but when it comes to comfort and, and quality together and um, uh, perception, basically, it's this, you know, you could, you could go from 250 hertz, 90 hertz, where you're like, ah, I can, I can take that, and then suddenly you drop ever so slightly to 60, and then you're back to uncomfortable zone, right? So, so we've got to come up with, like, okay, what is this minimum uh, point uh, in terms of frame rate? And this is going to be, for each application, it's going to need a minimum, right? So it's not for all applications. There's no, like, one minimum for uh, all applications. There's actually uh, per, so for 360 uh, degree videos, you probably need at least 90 frames per second in order for it to be comfortable because of the degrees of freedom that we have over there, right? Um, in terms of, the, uh, we need to extend the scale from like being, okay, kind of upset to throwing up, right? So this, those are the kind of the extremes. So we gotta extend the scale and we gotta make sure that we sit in the preference scale where everybody's happy, and then we can improve on that. But when we start going into the critical zone, uh, we've got to start thinking about you know, what are we doing wrong, right? And how do we fix that as an industry? And you know, maybe don't ship a product that would make you violently nauseous. And, 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 and the thing is, it, this is uh, application-based. So we just need to figure out which applications can work in, in, with specific uh, uh, criteria, right? So, uh, so like I was saying, uh, VR 360, the minimum viable product requirement should probably be 90 frames per second, and, and that's for 3 off, right? Um, so if, if I had a headlocked video, right, and I'm just watching, like, uh, AR glasses, and I'm just watching a YouTube video, could be headlocked, 
in that case, I probably could get away with 48, 48 frames per second, right? Uh, because it's headlocked. It might look a little flickery, but you know, in terms of like being able to watch it for low power reasons, I might want to drop my frame rate on there. So, so depending on what applications you're trying to push, we, we definitely want to set the minimum bar where we all, as a community, think this is going to be acceptable. Right? So, so yeah. So the way way I'm I'm thinking about this is we've got to create this spider diagram with each application. Do not go underneath. Don't, do not go into the red zone, basically, right? Um, and each one of these are going to be like a critical feature for that application. So in this case, this is the mixed reality application A. Um, yeah, for some reason, it's, uh, accommodation vergence is very low. So it's probably something to do with like looking at things far away. Uh, I don't know. It could be a military application because uh, field of view is critical and resolution is critical. So you kind of need to know what, to, what you're looking at and quickly. Uh, because latency is, is critical over here, right? So, uh, so whatever the application is, we need to have this like minimum viable uh, spider pro plot and minimum uh, be outside of that area and then uh, decide which one of these axes are critical or not for that, uh, for that product and including just uh, specifying if something is a preference or not, right? So we could have something that could be just a preference in terms of accommodation versions for this. As long as the objects are not coming close to you and not, not interacting with them, fine. Let's just leave accommodation versions as a, pre a preference in this case, right? So I think the key thing is over here is like not everything has to be critical. It's application-based. And some of these things are critical, so we've got to like create this critical list for every application. And so, so there's a lot of categorization and a lot of specifications to be done. And I think as a, as a standards group, that could really work well. And so I, I don't know if we have enough standards groups that are uh, approaching it this way. So my encouragement is to like start thinking about things uh, in this way. So yeah, there's another application uh, where uh, resolution is super important and uh, frame rate's important, but color gamut and dynamic range and field of view are not because this could be just like a heads up display for all we care about, right? We're just looking at, you know, turn left, turn right here kind of uh, type of information. I don't need all those things, so this is kind of the, uh, the minimum uh, vibe. So we've been talking about preference, and then now we talked about like what's critical. Uh, so now, you know, what's perceivable, right? So uh, I, I wanted to put a little, uh, um, uh, what was that? Uh, What's that movie with the uh, goes inconceivable? It's like an imperceivable. That's what we're going for, right? <laughs> Princess Bride. Yes. <laughs> it's like it's like I don't think it means what you think it means. Right? <laughs> All right. So imperceivable. That's where we're going, right? So you know, how do we characterize perceivable? Right? It's the same thing, right? So it's, it's we're going to use classic uh, psychophysics experiments. We, do, we run some user experiments. And this is another thing that people get uh, confused by is preference versus when we're doing pre uh, um, our perception studies. It's not really user studies to find preference. It's more about finding a threshold of where, uh, how your brain works, how your eye brain works, right? So we have a, a light source in this case, you know, turn up the light source until you see a difference in the brightness, and then you characterize that in terms of a psychometric function. It's like, I don't see any difference, and then suddenly, boom, I see the difference. Well, we're characterizing humans, right? Uh, I mean, you could just stick a probe neural link into somebody's brain and, and figure out that rather than having to wait for a reaction, but I think that's, uh, actually, I think uh, Sean McCarthy's not here. Okay. I think Sean McCarthy is the only person I know who's actually done that type of thing on with the chinchilla's uh, 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 optic nerve. He actually probed it to see what signals are coming off of that. So uh, if you, you've done that, I'm super interested in hearing how, you, how and what you probed in order to get the equivalent, right? But we, do, we don't, uh, no, no animals are hurt in our experiments, right? So, except they're tortured to, and then they're given swag at the end of the. Uh, <laughs> So, okay, so we're trying to characterize how people are, respond to uh, images. And, of course, you know, we already have been using this, so this is not something new. You know, JPEG uses exactly this, right? You take a raw image, you do block-based DCT, you drop some high-frequency components, you, drop as, you, know, you, you keep dropping components until they're like, hey, I don't like that picture, I, I see a difference. And so now we know where the perceptual model for uh, JPEG sits. So it's basically, it's just the, the variable is the number of high-frequency components to drop, right? So in the same way, um, 
we did this for uh, luminance, right? So at Dolby, you'll see a lot of the SMPTE studies. Uh, basically, I mean, this is actually a good, good uh, uh, thing for if you're part of a company that's building a display to make sure you have enough bits. I mean, that's a very classic uh, mistake to do. And then you build a prototype that's, I don't know, let's say 10 nits, and you only use four bits. And, uh, you know, the, uh, every, you know f for four bits, if you do RGB 4404, then you've got 12 bits, and you have 4,000 unique colors that you can f stick inside of this volume, right? And uh, each point inside that volume, the next point next to it has to be one JND away, right? Uh, if it's not one JND, you start getting artifacts like banding, and you can't represent multiple colors, you can't do shading and things like that. It's not unusable, it's just you can't use it effectively. So when you have 10 nits, uh, you know, two points in that gamut is going to be very close together, and so you're not going to run into these problems, and it's going to look great. And then tomorrow you're going to make that same display 2,000 nits and four bits, it's not going to work. Why? Because any two points are going to stretch past one JND. It's going to be like five JNDs, right? So now all of a sudden uh, you're trying to do some kind of shading on a person's face and it looks all bandy because of the fact that you can't, you can't make a, tra a smooth transition, right? So, so basically, you know, these brightness levels should be done in a perceptual way. So if you do get banding and you only have four bits, well, you gotta do something else. You gotta dither. I'm like, well, what does dither mean? Well, I gotta like light up multiple pixels by some noise injection or whatever technique that you decide to use. Uh, but it's kind of counter productive because you're making smaller pixels and then growing them with, with dithering, and that has all sorts of other Im, uh, impacts, which I'll uh, talk to you about later as well. So ideally, that volume, all those points inside that volume should be spread perceptually. So this work has already been done in SIMT 2084, and I'm not uh, you know, advertising in this curve. You know, Rafael has his own curve, which he came up with way before Dolby did, right? Uh, it was perceptual, what was it called, the PU, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so there are multiple curves. This is one curve that got standardized, right, SMT 2084, and it was based on exactly this. We studied basically how human uh, perception uh, works in, in one J and D apart all the way through, and then what you'll see is basically uh, at the lower scales, the, the J and Ds are, any slight increase in light is, is uh, more sensitive uh, in those lower uh, lower end, and then at the upper scale, you can see that you can jump, you know, three nits, and it'll be one JND, right? So, uh, just replace that gamma curve is basically what I'm saying. Don't use gamma on displays anymore. We really need to move away from there. Uh, we know perceptually it doesn't work, and if you look at the history of gamma, where did it come from? It came from trying to make the CRT electron gun linear, right? And so somebody uh, characterized that said, hey, here's your curve to undo the electron gun, and it kind of stuck through all displays from there on out, and nobody knew why. We just kind of used that. It kind of had a similar kind of function, you know, as, as the eye responses, but that only worked to a certain uh, luminance and, and dynamic range. Now we're talking about things all the way up to 10,000 nits, you know, 1,000, 2,000 nits. Gamma doesn't work anymore, right? So let's dump gamma as much as, as much as possible, right? So let's get let's start working in perceptual space, right? Um, now, you know, eye tracking and perceivable or imperceivable, uh, however you, you. Now we've got this two displays on your face, and you've got eye tracking. We know exactly where you're looking at. What can we leverage this for, right? So basically. A 360 frame, let's just pretend this is an application, VR uh, 360 videos. Uh, so if I unpack that uh, cube map, it's the equivalent of 12 4K images for one frame. That one raw frame is 12 4K images. Then run that at 60 frames per second, that's pretty insane, right? There's no way we're going to get that type of data to a headset, right? So now you have to compromise it. Do you compromise the whole image? Probably a bad idea to do that, right? So what's better to do is actually look at how your eye perceives the world and how you actually see in the real world. And, and the idea there is that your fovea has high resolution and your peripheral has low resolution. So everybody knows this. So let's start like leveraging that and send the data uh, only f for what you're looking at, right? So, uh, you know, Kodaks and everything like that have not been leveraging this as much as then they need to start leveraging this a lot more so that you can save in terms of optimization. 
yeah, this is a preference in, in terms of like, you know, well, you'll, you'll get that image somehow, but if this is, image is going to be at the cost of frame rate, I'll say, go, to, go get your frame rate fixed so that you don't have a nauseous experience and figure out how to optimize, right? So you optimize so you to get frame rate, right? So, um, yeah, of course, you, know, you can blur the peripheral uh, image and then the foveal image make it very high uh, resolution, and then that will look imperceivable, right? Uh, and then the other option is to actually go further and look at how you uh, see color in the peripheral and optimize for that as well. So there's a whole bunch of optimizations that you can do to keep squeezing and squeezing the, the, uh, the, um, the bandwidth and, ev and everything out of that, right? So, okay, so now we've got all of these, um, these minimum viable product definitions, and uh, we also have our applications. How in the world are we going to design products, right? So this is kind of the, the model that uh, you know, I've kind of set up within uh, uh, our company, which is basically let's look at the product and the specifications in terms of the applications and uh, the requirements, right? Power, ID, price, and those types of things. So that goes to, uh, to our team. We, we try to spec out. Okay, here's kind of from a perception point of view, translate that for the component guys, right? Um, and the component guys, each, you know, the display, the optics, what kind of MTF, you know, how fast does the processing need to be? What type of processing do you need to do? You know, distortion, correction, all that stuff. What battery are you going to need based off of that, you know, in terms of like how bright should it get? And then also, you know, how long does this product need? So it, it, it's a combination of multiple groups that are working on this. Right? And then basically, given that spec, the build team will go and try to build something, and then they come back and say, yeah, what you're asking for is impossible. You're, you know, it doesn't, doesn't happen in this world. Right? And then they'll, instead of just saying it can't be done, they'll give you a bunch of knobs that you can turn. It's like, oh, I can get to this level of MTF, or I can get to this you know, pixel density for uh, resolution, uh, and then the optics guys will do the same, and then the, the processing guys will be like, I can't get anything lower, you know, even with asynchronous time warp and everything. Like, this is as fast as we get it. Uh, and then, of course, all the display characteristics in terms of like scanning and everything like that, uh, you know, takes down. So all of these limiters come into play, and then basically we dial each of these knobs to see what we can do. And then that goes back and tells us what applications can and can't run, basically, right? So, and then we kind of try to fine-tune this and, and constantly build on this, right? So, in order to do this type of work, it takes a lot of different people, a lot of different capabilities, and, you know, uh, the tagline, and, and I, I've gotten some feedback on changing this, and I, I probably will, but let me see if people understand my tagline. Impedance matching imaging products to the human visual system. All right. <laughs> Excellent, because the feedback was a lot of people don't know what impedance is, and that's only electrical engine. Unfortunately, I'm a systems guy. I've done like silicon, and so that's my language. So if it's not your language, I'm going to I'll have to find a word to replace that with. But this, the great thing is, you know, I, st I actually stole this from Michael Abrash. I wasn't the one who came up with this. So I'm, I'm using this directly from his quote. I'd like to keep that impedance. So if I need to educate you guys about what impedance is, you know, come and tap me on the shoulder and I'll tell you what it is so, from an electrical engineering point of view, right? So, uh, so yeah, so the, the different teams we, we have looking at this is we have a dynamic visual ergonomics team that's looking at all this active vision stuff. We have a systems algorithms and models team. We have a perceptual graphics team. We have a perceptual image quality team. We have perceptual systems. And then, of course, we have the program platform uh, engineering and execution team. And then we have display systems research and then a user experience research. So all of us work together really tightly, and we, we try to answer some of these questions. And, of course, we would love for everybody else to, uh, to work with us on answering some of these, like, critical questions that need to set the MVP. So if there's a standards group that wants to start forming around us, we're more than willing to be part of it, right? So, um, so in terms of how we build with these teams, we try to build these build, measure, learn loops. You know, we have a hypothesis, and then we try to build something uh, we build that platform, and then based on that platform, we measure something, we take that data, and then we try to learn, uh, and then based on that, we try to loop again, right? Uh, and then how we plan, so the, the circle plan, uh, execute is, is this way, but when we're planning, we're like, okay, what do we need to learn? Uh, what kind of data do we need to collect? What exactly are we going to measure? That'll tell us what kind of platform to build, and then that, that's what, what we uh, built. So we, pl we plan this way, and we execute that way, right? So... 
Um, so what is our teams doing? Uh, it, it, just as an example, you've probably have seen a whole bunch of papers coming out of us, and you're like, what are the, all these random like, things that these guys are publishing? When? Why, why is Meta publishing these things? So it was exactly because of all of this. So hopefully now you understand the rationale behind a lot of the work that we are publishing and putting out there. And it's because we want to move the industry forward to make great you know, AR, VR immersive products, basically. Right? So some of the stuff that we've been looking at, you know, world locking, you know, uh, if you have a projected image and it drags with you and then bounces back in relationship and you're trying to like look at the pressure of that uh, that cylinder, you know, one is it a critical feature? If it doesn't lock, you know, what are, what are the requirements there, right? What what amount of error is tolerable, right? And um, you know, what type of application can tolerate world locking error and how much, right? So it's not every application doesn't have to be perfect, so we have to have a window. What is that minimum for each application, I think, is, is, is an interesting thing to answer. And you should see some papers coming out of uh, uh, our groups from that. And, of course, persistence, right? I mean, if you have the display on for the full frame rate, you're basically dragging that same frame uh, for that whole, like, if it's 10 milliseconds, uh, one for one frame, you're dragging that same frame, and then suddenly it bounces back, right? So it's like bounce and then it drags again, right? So uh, that's not a really pleasant experience. That is actually a critical feature, so we need to fix that, right? So how much do we want to lower that persistence standby so it basically appears and then it disappears while your head is moving and then it appears again? I mean, but it's still on for a period of time, so you're kind of dragging. So, you know, Scott uh, on our team kind of uh, uh, has built this kind of simulation of, of what it would look like, the raw data uh, in slow motion. Like, as you see this image, it flashes and then it drags, and flashes and it drags, and then what you will see on your retina is basically that, right? And because of the, the persistence. So, so what are the effects of this and you know, is, are the types of things that we need to uh, answer? What's acceptable in terms of this, right? So, uh, yeah, so the trade-off, to, the, the trade-off question to ask over here is frame rate and persistence or resolution, right? You can clearly see that I can work super hard for resolution and get a crappy resolution in the end because of persistence. And this is assuming a saccade, right? So, but most people, when you're looking at your image, you're always saccading around the image. So it's not like, you know, yeah, I, can, I can lock your eye in one place at all times and get a perfect image for you know, fractions of a second. It's not... It's, it's, you have to do these trade-off analysis in terms of like what persistent, what resolution. And if you get, I mean, at that point, you might as well make larger pixels because it's going to be blurrier anyway. So, so what is the uh, effect of all of this is, is one thing, right? Uh, and a high, higher frame rate is always pref preferable and because n when you're doing low, low persistence and high frame rate, you actually get higher brightness because of the integration of the light uh, because the on time is going to be on for significantly longer. So, um, so uh, of course, low persistence, if you get too low, I squeeze that to like a, a impulse, what are the effects on that? So those are the things that we need to look at. You know, is it possible that we're going to have some kind of uh, saccadic mislocation issues, right? So this image is there. My eye starts moving towards the image to take a look at it. It starts moving, and then suddenly the image disappears, right? And then it's not there, and then, you know, and then it pops back into existence. So what is your eye during, uh, and doing during that, and how, you know, how much of an effect is this, and how bad of an effect is this? So we've got to look at that as well. And then, of course, Flickr. Um, uh, Alex, I think, is presenting a paper today on this, right? Uh, so increasing luminance, uh, does it become worse? And so some of these results may surprise you. So a little advertisement for uh, Alex's paper. Um, and then, of course, uh, what is the effect of this bright object in, in your foveal versus peripheral, right? Uh, you'll see some of those results today. And then if you increase that, you know, does it follow with what, what, what we expect? So... Uh, these are some of the things that uh, we're interested in answering, right? So, and of course, binocular real world, right? Uh, the real world, you're looking at an, one image, and it's it's perfectly overlapped. There's no uh, worry about it being off. And then suddenly you have a display that you know, your glasses tweak, and everything different happens to the glasses, and you know how do you keep those aligned? And what is the effect of having displays like this, right? Um, I think well, I went to one seminar and they were designing um, uh, displays for pilots and apparently one of the pilots had to go to the ER um, because he had to look at this vertical disparity that was too high 
that caused him to have uh, headaches and nausea for like over two days, apparently. So, uh, so yeah, you, you have to be careful, right? So we don't want to do this to our consumer product guys. And, and you know, pilots are supposed to be immune to everything, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> At least I hope they are. Uh, and then, of course, uh, my emotion, you know, in terms of like, what, what, what effect does this have in motion? Because this is going to cause depth errors. You know, and there's depth errors due to all sorts of things. Pixel size, alignment, layout, uh, due to luminous differences, uh, you know, display processing, corrections. You do a, a, you know, in one eye, depending on where the object is and the distortion correction that you apply to it, suddenly these things don't over, overlap correctly. So there's like this varying depth errors. And then, of course, color differences. Uh, and then... Yeah, don't ever scan a display like this, but it's just an illustration of, of scanning. Like if you're updating the display, you're updating from inside out, top down, left, right. Yeah. This is showing inside out, which I don't know why you do, but let's pretend that you would do that. Right? <laughs> uh, of course, color breakup. Right? Uh, a lot of displays are uh, field sequential, and you're flashing red, green, blue. So uh, thanks to Scott again on this one. Uh, basically, uh, you know, the idea is that you, if your eye saccades and it's color uh, field sequential, you're going to see uh, color breakup, right? And, and the way your eye sees this is, is um, going to be a little disturbing. So the question is how disturbing? Is it acceptable? What are the applications that this limits us to? Uh, those are things that we have to answer. And then, of course, we need foveated metrics because you know, we, we know now that your fovea has different characteristics than your peripheral, so we want to talk about like uh, some of the papers that uh, we worked on, and uh, guys are, are in this room. <laughs> uh, and you know, in terms of like, how do we measure? How does the what's the what's the uh, difference prediction between two uh, when we present an image from the uh, the ideal image, and how do we quantify that? So we need all these quantification metrics. So that's part of the standards group. So we probably need is is lots of metrics so that we can use as a community uh, to assess whether what we're presenting is good enough and you know what we need a unified language in terms of a score of like what's acceptable or not and these are the types of metrics that would kind of would be valuable of course we're trying to do a lot of optimizations and things like that so uh, influencing the rendering pipeline you know in terms of like perceptibility uh, can we degrade the mesh where can we degrade the mesh you know, so those are papers uh, that are out already uh, that you can take a look at and the kind of the studies that our groups do. And, of course, text quality, right? Uh, depending on your application, if text quality is a very important one, we've got to figure out how do we address all the text quality issues. Like how much contrast do you need in order to be able to read something, right? Uh, you know, read a long document, a short document, you know, it's about glanceability or not, right? So style and size matter, right? And then, of course, pitch resolution and fill factor, and then monocular versus binocular. What are the differences? If I'm looking at text with binocular, uh, you know, what are, what are the characteristics will be different than if I'm looking at it monocularly? Can I read a whole book with the monocular text? Right. So those are the types of things that we've got to uh, look at, agree on, and so you know, we're going to be uh, very interested in that because we think a lot of your applications are going to need to be reading things. Right. So. Um, of course, you know, display processing affects two texts, like anti-aliasing, sub-pixel rendering, color breakup, right? If you have a field sequential uh, um, display and you're looking at white text and you move your, even move your eyes across, it's going to be like, you know, colors all over the place. Can you read that? Yeah. So those are the types of things we've got to figure out. Uh, of course, dithering has an effect as well. So. Uh, High dynamic range work, uh, you sh probably have seen some of the uh, SIGGRAPH stuff that just happened recently. Uh, and you know, we're looking at what are the pipelines look like, uh, what is the binocular HDR, uh, what would that be like, you know, what are the realistic luminance expectations for indoor, outdoor, again, that's a preference thing, right? Uh, and then you know, low contrast challenges, right? We've got these lenses. You can't, you can't get high contrast with a, with a lens. And what type of lens? Can we find a lens that gives us uh, the same contrast as like no lens, right? Uh, so all of these have uh, impact and, and how we're going to do display management. Like how do we take a display that we were displaying on a TV and display it in a headset and you say, oh, those two are the same picture rather than it looking completely different or degrading the quality so far without adding something to it to make it acceptable. So we don't want to... 
we want to drive the display on your head to be the main display for the future for you, right? For all things, right? So, uh, yeah, in terms of lumi realistic luminances, there was a paper uh, published about, you know, in terms of indoor preference and outdoor preferences, you know, what, what would people want, right? So, um, and then now I'll end with uh, let's do nothing well, right? <laughs> what I mean by that is, you know, if, if you're going to do, ship something, uh, ship a, a pair of glasses with pass-through, it's got to do nothing well. When it's in its off state, it needs to be a pair of glasses. You can't have, like, weird distortions that make people sick, pupil swim, rainbow. I mean, all of this is going to be there, but to what level? What is acceptable? What's the minimum do nothing, uh, you know? So, and of course, color, non-uniformity, and all those types of things, like binocular uniformity, uh, and then, of course, real-world depth errors. You'll see some papers coming out about, uh, from there. Like, even in the pass-through, you could have caused problems to the real world, right? So, uh, how much is acceptable or not because of all the manufacturing tolerances and things like that. So, um, yeah. So, ultimately, you know, recently in the news, you know, Congress said uh, the Army can't spend any more money on buying more headsets, so $400 million got stopped, basically. Uh, but it can, uh, they said they can't spend money on a new version to fix the problems that are making the soldiers sick. So what, <laughs> yeah, this, this whole presentation is about like, hey, let's quantify that and let's fix it, right? And let's help each other out so that our soldiers don't get sick, our, uh, our consumers don't buy the product and then sit on the shelf and never use it, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. If we fix it, then of course there'll be more problems, right? So, um, okay, so let's let's get like any thought about those last four faces being on any of our products. Like when somebody's doing a review of our products, those last four should show up, basically, right? So let's make uh, customers enjoy a pleasing experience, and so let's share information, define standards, create unified metrics, right? And then impedance match imaging products for the human visual system, right? So ultimately, that's the goal, right? Uh, thank you, and I'm not sure how much time we have left for questions, but... <laughs>